screen. Okay, can 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 we see this, Sergey? Is it uh, this in the laser pointer? It's good. Okay. Yes, laser pointer is good. So we see the screen. All good. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So the talk that I'm going to give today is work that I've done for the past ten years on the Mississippi River, specifically the lowermost Mississippi River, and it's been a study to try to combine hydrodynamics in sediment transport measurements to inform and validate numerical modeling efforts to better understand about the timing and magnitude of sediment flux within the lowermost Mississippi River. So the portion of the river that is connected to its downstream delta in the Gulf of Mexico. And besides just the, the, the interest scientifically with this work, what we want to do for an applied purpose is to better constrain how we can inform ideas about using river water and sediment to divert from the channel itself to mitigate against coastal wetland loss. That is to move water and sediment into the remaining wetlands and allow for the deposition of those materials and allow to prevent there to be such massive erosion of the Mississippi Delta. And I will touch upon all these concepts in today's talk. So that's a very broad overview. So generally speaking, in a very broad sense, why do we care about research on large river sedimentology and deltaic geomorphology? Well, the first is that river deltas are incredibly dynamic systems. River deltas build and destroy hundreds of square kilometers of land per century. And they have vertical movement rates, for example, subsidence or deposition that rival any region on Earth's surface. And that includes tectonically active regions where we might expect there to be significant mountain building. While mountains build vertically and shed or denude, river deltas also build vertically in terms of their deposition and they subside with subsidence rates that are higher than most other locations on Earth's surface. They're geologically important. Studies of modern fluvial deltaic systems provide insights for interpreting ancient depositional systems through their stratigraphy. For example, through the stratigraphic lens, we can ask questions about how Earth's climate and its surface systems like rivers and deltas responded to large climate excursions or perturbations in Earth's history. So we can use insights of studies from modern systems to better inform our stratigraphic interpretations of ancient delta systems. Uh, finally, as I've mentioned already, they're societally relevant. 60%, some 60% of the world's population lives in coastal delta settings. And so there's a strong need to connect sediment transport to land building in order to elucidate how deltas will respond to climate change. In fact, this is the engineering challenge that I would say that our community has for the next century to better understand how we can engineer to protect deltas from subsiding and drowning due to climate change. So a little bit more regionally speaking, the work I'm gonna to speak to you about today is from the lowermost Mississippi River. And as I've already alluded to, there's a strong need to prevent land loss in the Mississippi Delta. This can be captured based on the satellite picture that you see on the left, which shows the Mississippi River moving into the Northern Gulf of Mexico. In the 20th century alone, we lost over 5,000 square kilometers of land. Basically what that is, is deltaic land that's been converted to open water due to a lack of sediment supply and accelerated subsidence of this low-lying landscape. Some predictions have the Mississippi Delta losing up to 13 and a half thousand additional square kilometers of land with just one meter rise of relative sea level, which is expected by the end of the 21st century. So we can see what that picture might look like here for the fate of the Mississippi River Delta if actions aren't taken to better constrain and divert water and sediment as a resource to help mitigate against this land loss. This outcome would be catastrophic to the United States as well as to the world. For example, the Port of Louisiana, which essentially is here in this region of the Mississippi Delta, is the largest shipping port in the Western Hemisphere by volume of materials traded. 45% of all wetlands in the lower 48 states of the United States reside in Louisiana. 
It's an extremely important energy sector for the United States economy. There's big oil and gas exploration on the Delta, as well as petrochemical refining. And this is actually home to a unique and eclectic culture of people that have settled this area for many centuries. And indeed, if we look at rivers and deltas in particular around the world, what we find is that they are home to some of the oldest civilizations. So protecting these areas is of critical importance to protecting our cultural legacies around the world. So what we know about engineered diversions of water and sediment is that they really require to tap into the sand load of these large rivers. You may ask, why do we focus our attention on sand when sand may comprise only 10 to 15 percent of the total sediment load of the river, so it's small compared to the mud that's moving through? Well, in order to use sediment to build uh, wetlands and buffer against wetland loss, sand is necessary in so far that it provides up to 70 percent of burgeoning or juvenile or young delta vol uh, sediment volume. Sand essentially deposits and creates a stable substrate upon which colonization of vegetation can take hold. And the colonization of that vegetation further baffles or reduces flow velocity over top of the deposit and allows for enhanced or accelerated deposition of other materials, including mud. So we focus our attention much on sand and understanding its transport through river systems to better constrain how we can divert that sand, make a deposit, and allow that deposit to feed to other deposit as well. Again, we're going to focus our attention to Mississippi River Drainage Basin, just taking a step back to provide you with an overview of what it looks like. This is it outlined in white here for the lower 48 states of the United States. You can see it extends up into portions of Canada here north of the border. It covers 12% of all North America and is the third largest drainage basin in the world. In terms of water and sediment discharge, the Mississippi River ranks seventh largest in the world. I'll focus your attention on this red box. This is the region of the lowermost Mississippi River where many of the science studies that I present to you today were collected from. This is a satellite image of the lower Mississippi River extending from its, the old river control structure up here, approximately 500 kilometers upstream of the outlet. If you see RK, that simply stands for river kilometers and it's measured in distance above the outlet here at Head of Passes. So you can see that the delta region essentially starts 500 kilometers upstream of the outlet here. We can progress to the south and southeast down the main stem Mississippi River. You can see it turns to the primarily east here, goes past the large city of New Orleans, and then eventually makes a southeastward turn where it has a relatively straight reach, building its classic bird's foot delta into the Gulf of Mexico. And this entire region that you see here is part of the Holocene-aged Mississippi Delta deposit. So just a little bit of background on what it is that we actually do to make the measurements that I'm going to show you for the rest of this talk. We have small boats like the one you see here. This is the RV Itasca. It's approximately eight meters in length. You can see it has a forward dry cabin here. We have all kinds of instrumentation that are put on this boat the most important of which is a multi-beam sonar system. It's a high resolution bathymetric measuring device. It's actually located right here. When we put it into the water, the multi-beam simply lowers on this pole. As this pole rises up, the multi-beam system lowers into the water. We also have a side scan sonar to delineate various sediment compositions on the channel bed. We have a chirp seismic system that allows us to penetrate into the subsurface to understand the underlying strata of the deposits on the bed. We have direct sampling methods by which we can grab uh, sand and sediment off of the channel bed, as well as take gravity or viber cores. We can directly sample the water column using a, uh, a device that's lowered to targeted depths in the water column. Uh, and what we do is we essentially look at what the concentration and grain size distribution of sediments and suspension are. And we can measure water column velocity using an ADCP device. And the ADCP for this particular sur survey boat is mounted on the bow right here. So you can see essentially within this eight meter boat, we have contained many devices that we can use to sample the river itself. So 
to give you a sense of what multi-beam data or the bathymetry of the Mississippi River looks like, I've included this slide here, which shows channel morphology near the city of New Orleans for two distinct discharge conditions. The first is a low discharge condition at 6,500 cubic meters per second, you can see here. So this may seem like a, a big number for those of you that perhaps are familiar with, with smaller river systems. For the Mississippi, however, this is a relatively low discharge case. For high discharge case, the 35,000 cubic meters per second, what you can see is that for the same reach of river here, we have a whole scale or complete change in the bed morphology. So here, during the low discharge case, we have small dunes that are about less than one meter in height, maybe half a meter to one meter in height, and in wavelength are 20 to 30 meters. In flood discharge conditions, what we do is trade out numerous small dunes for few but very large dunes. And these dunes have wavelengths on the order of one to 200 meters and heights on the order of up to 10 meters. Now, what I'll do is draw your attention to the bend segment of this particular reach of river that we surveyed. In both conditions, in both cases, you can see there's seemingly this point where the dunes disappear right here. And for this case, during low discharge, it exists right here. And within the deep bend section of this river, what you find is a channel bed that's completely devoid of sand and indeed dunes, dunes themselves. So what this says is that the translation of the sand moving through this part of the river must occur by way of both migration of these dunes as they slowly but surely push their way downstream as well as suspension of the material. What we're hypothesizing here is that this cutoff right here is due to some limit by which the dunes can no longer remain stable and the sand must be suspended and carried through this bend segment as a part of suspended load transport. So we have two different modes of transport of the sand by both bed forms and suspension. And we're gonna look in greater detail about how this occurs throughout the rest of this talk. But what I'd like to do now is take a step back and show you how divergent these optics are or these, view, it's, these views of the Mississippi are compared to how we traditionally view lowland river systems as understood by geomorphology community from the past several decades. So for example, there's classic studies by Saucier and Walker from the 1980s and 1990s that show that large lowland fluvial systems such as the Mississippi River are essentially built out of their own alluvial sandy material and that the channel bed should be comprised almost entirely of sand. Now, while you may have divergences in the grain size of the material that occupies that bed in association with spatially variable hydrodynamic stress conditions, for example, moving into an outer bend segment here of, of the river meander, you nevertheless completely cover the bed with sandy material that's made available from upstream within the catchment of the river system. And in fact, if we think about how these deposits associated with large lowland rivers are reflected in the stratigraphic record, we might see something like what Walker produced here in 1984, which is a vertical succession of stratigraphy that essentially shows sand, perhaps with some mud, but nevertheless complete sand. The point I'm trying to make here is that by traditional viewpoint of geomorphology, lowland rivers have a bed that's entirely covered by sand. There's a balance between local flow stress and bed sediment grain size. And the uniqueness of the lower Mississippi River as I showed to you in the previous slide, is that we have some sort of composition of eroding substratum in limited alluvial cover or the traditional sand that we'd expect to find in a river system. So just to emphasize that point a little bit more, I've included here some additional um, multi-beam survey images that show what the composition of the bed looks like. This particular segment of the river comes adjacent to the French Quarter in the city of New Orleans. The direction of flow is from the bottom to the top before it makes a right-hand turn here. And what I've done is outline the limit of alluvial sand cover based on this black dashed line here. And as again, as we move into this deep segment, what we find is eroding channel bed substrate in the deep section of this bend right here, up to 70 meters deep, but no alluvial cover. So what we see is that in this relatively tight bend segment, there's absolutely no sand to speak of bank to bank across this particular part of the river. 
It's a little bit different in what I call subtle bend sections of the river, where instead of having a sharp bend, we have a bend nevertheless, but we still have a mixture of alluvial cover with eroding substratum. And this comes from a different segment of the Mississippi River, a little bit upstream from the section that I just showed you, where here flow is moving from left to right, um, as you can see with this arrow here. And what we have is a composition of an alluvial sandbar, a point bar here, and channel bottom substrate exposed underneath the thalweg of this particular part of the river. So what we have then is a composition of both sand and substrate exposed in these subtle bend segments. Now, if we go to what we call a thalweg cross, that is where the thalweg is pushed from one bank line to another bank line due to two opposing bend segments in the river, you can see here moving from the left bank to the right bank in this case, we have complete alluvial cover of sandy sediment across the bed. So in this particular circumstance, we don't expose any of the underlying substrate, but instead have dunes that mantle the bed bank to bank. Okay, we can put these observations together in a more quantitative framework. And I've done so in this particular plot here, which shows radius of curvature for the various segments of the Mississippi River progressing downstream across the lower 165 kilometers of the river system itself. So just to reference you again, river kilometer zero references the outlet of the Mississippi River. New Orleans is situated here at about river kilometer 160. And what we find is that as our radius of curvature decreases, as you can see these different segments moving down here, we find that they are actually typified by channel bed substrate exposed bank to bank. whereas if we have a bend segment, but it doesn't have a significantly high radius of curvature, as shown by these, indicated by these triangles here, what we find is a channel bed with a mixture of substrate and alluvial cover. And in fact, where we have straight reach segments with a thalway cross, as I showed you in the previous slide, what we find here are dunes that are mantled on the bed bank to bank. So we can actually quantify what the distribution is of the various cover of the Mississippi River specifically its substrate versus the sandy bed forms. We can also use a plot to demonstrate that we can actually calculate based on radius of curvature and channel depth, what the composition of the channel bed would look like. So a lower radius of curvature and um, a deeper bed itself actually produces these very tight bend segments without any sediment composition, I'm sorry, without any sandy sediment composition on the channel bed. Whereas if we lower the depth and increase radius of curvature, we can have bend segments that have a mixture, and eventually we can go into segments of the Thalway Cross that are relatively shallow with a high radius of curvature that show here we have complete alluvial coverage. This is a powerful tool because it allows us to use river plan form alone to evaluate both flow depth and the composition of the sediment on the channel bed of the Mississippi River. I would just like to make one comment about the erosion of the substrate of the Mississippi River. We can go through in detail and document the morphology of these erosional features, as I've shown you in these multi-beam snapshots here. And we can measure their aspect ratios, specifically their width versus their length. And if we look, for example, at flute length or flute amplitude versus flute width, what we find for the Mississippi River as plotted here in these two particular um, uh, data plots here, is that they fall directly on a nice one-to-one -one line that was produced by erosional flutes that we find um, in, in um, experiments by a seminal study by J.R.L. Allen in 1971. So in fact, we see that the eroding substrate of the Mississippi River, as you can see here, at least the amplitude and and, and length of these particular erosional features nicely matches those that are traditionally assigned to bedrock channels itself that, as I mentioned, J.R.L. Allen showed in 1971. So essentially these erosional features geometrically match the sorts of flutes and potholes that we observe in upland bedrock streams and flume experiments. So what we find for the lowermost Mississippi River is that its channel is entrenched into and confined by steep sidewall substratum, the channel bed com is comprised of a patchwork of relatively thin sand deposits and eroding, eroding substratum, 
and the sidewall and channel bottom substratum effectively lock the channel plan form in place. In essence, this substratum behaves as a surrogate bedrock for the Mississippi River. And if we look at the distribution of sand versus this substratum here for large portions of the Mississippi River, what we find is that the lower Mississippi River can actually be qualified as a mixed bedrock alluvial river based on the fact that it's essentially eroding into this ancient substratum. This raises a key question. Why in one of the world's largest river basins do we seemingly have a lack of sand to cover the entire channel bed of the Mississippi River? So the question then is why is sand cover so spatially limited in the lowermost Mississippi River? And I'll give you a hint, bed load flux is not enough to account for this observation because bed load flux alone is sufficient to cover the bed with two to five centimeters of sand per year. So over years or decades or even centuries, one should expect there to be plenty of bed load sediment flux to cover the channel bed with sediment. What I'll, what I'll suggest is that it's related to the style of sediment transport, its timing and magnitude. And to give you a sense of what I mean by that, what I've done here is plotted sediment transport as measured by way of bed form flux versus water discharge on the y-axis here. You can see a regression line fit to the measurements that are shown as these blue um, triangles that you see here. And what we find as shown in this log scale on the y-axis is that there's a hundred fold increase in bed load flux for the Mississippi River for only a five to six fold increase in water discharge. So this is remarkable, right? This, what this shows is that sediment flux increases by two orders of magnitude, a factor of a hundred for simply just a, a four to five fold increase in water discharge. To give you a sense of how divergent this change in sediment flux is for the lower Mississippi River, what I'd like to do is show you the measured bed material discharge for two very small tributary systems in the broader Mississippi River catchment, the North Loop River and the Niobrara River here, which have water discharges significantly smaller than the Mississippi River. But what we find during low discharge for the Mississippi River, at least in terms of bed material transport, are comparable numbers in terms of volume per unit time. Whereas the water discharge might be a thousand times higher than what we find for the lower Mississippi River, nevertheless, the bed material fluxes are quite similar. Whereas if we go to a high discharge case for the Mississippi River, so for example, from 6,000 cubic meters to 34,000 cubic meters, what we find is approximately 100 fold increase in sediment discharge, as I showed you from the previous slide. So this motivates two questions that we're gonna talk about in the ensuing portions of this talk. Why does sediment transport in the Mississippi River vary by two orders of magnitude in time? And can we link this transport variability to a mixed bedrock alluvial channel? And for that, to answer those questions, we're gonna go out and collect detailed measurements of water flow and sediment flux within the lower Mississippi River. We're gonna use targeted field studies to measure local sand transport variability and characterize the time change of the bed flow stress. The data sets we're gonna acquire are bed load transport rates, suspended bed sediment concentration, and water velocity profiles over two water discharge conditions, January and April of 2008 where we have a moderate discharge in January of 11,000 cubic meters per second and a flood discharge in April of 38,000 cubic meters per second. The reach that we're gonna be working in is down here called the Empire Reach, just downstream of the city of New Orleans. And here's a picture of our boat, the research vessel Itasca, and myself and a colleague here deploying a water sampler into the river itself. Okay, the point, that we're trying to get after with these detailed measurements is to use these field data with physical models to evaluate how boundary stress changes in the lower Mississippi River. To give you a sense of the basic relationships that we're gonna be dealing with, we're gonna relate boundary stress, tau B here, with its classic depth slope product, which looks at the density of the fluid times gravity acceleration, times depth, times slope of the system itself here. We can also relate boundary stress to the shear velocity through its, the, through its square times the density of the fluid. 
The shear velocity in turn can be related to the mean flow velocity as shown in this relationship here, times some sort of friction coefficient. Another important factor that we're gonna look at is the skin friction shear stress, shown as this tau sub SF here, which is related to the boundary stress, as we showed in these two relationships here, minus the stress that's extracted from the flow due to form drag. Now form drag in rivers traditionally consists of bars and dune forms, which essentially exert friction on the flow and therefore create form drag. In essence, you're extracting from the boundary stress some portion of the stress that is consumed in form drag and whatever's left behind, the skin friction stress is what's made available to move sediment. So first thing we're gonna do is look at bed load sediment transport in the lower Mississippi River. And the way we get after this is by using time iterative measurements of bed bathymetry as shown in this particular plot, which differences two sequential multi-beam snapshots of the Mississippi River and differences them to understand how bed elevation has changed with evolution of the dune form field, essentially the migration of the dunes themselves. So what you see in red here is deposition on the channel bed and green here is erosion of the channel bed in association with the downstream translation of these dunes. Now in a balanced or equilibrated world, we would expect there to be equal erosion for deposition. And in most cases we find that. But in any case, what we can do is take these measurements for volume change and use them to calculate a sediment flux, put that sediment flux into a traditional sediment flux bed form algorithm as shown here, and essentially invert this formulation here to calculate the shear velocity and use that shear velocity to calculate the shear stress. And what we find after using a number of transport formula is that we have a stress that ranges between about one and 1.5 for low discharge and between about 7.9 and 14 pascals for high discharge. Now, another data set that we can use to determine information about shear stress are actually the suspended sand or bed material profiles. And what this plot here is showing you is distance above the channel bed in meters. So you can see it's a rather deep uh, portion of the river here at 30 meters versus volumetric sand concentration. So these black squares here represent all sand data, whereas these open triangles here represent sand greater than 200 microns. We can fit these data with a Rousean profile, a Rouse model that's shown here, where the Rouse model is tuned by this P parameter. This P is the Rouse number, which essentially relates settling velocity of the particle, which is a primarily a function of the size of the particle to shear velocity of the flow shown here as U star F. And by tuning this model to the data sets, we can back out or extract what the stress conditions are to give these profiles. And what we find is that during high discharge, we have up to 7.4 pascals. And during low discharge, we have something between 4.8 pascals. Another data set that we can use to further constrain stress conditions in the Mississippi River are the flow velocity data. Those are produced from our ADCP, Acoustic Doppler Current Profiler measuring device. And what we find in this particular plot is distance above the bed on the y-axis with respect to the flow velocity on the x-axis here. And you can see the data are fit here. And again, we can fit a model, a theoretical velocity profile model to the data here. In this case, we use what we call a law of the wall theoretical velocity profile, which relates velocity u for a given depth z through this u star here, which again is the shear velocity. And by tuning this particular model to our data, we can invert the profile to calculate what the shear velocity is, and then use that shear velocity to calculate boundary stress. In fact, when we do that with our velocity profiles, we get numbers that are very similar to what we calculated using our Rousean model, which I showed you in the previous slide, and our bedform transport models, which I showed you two slides ago. So if we summarize the skin friction shear stress conditions for the Mississippi River, what we find is that we have from low discharge to flood discharge, about an eight times increase. We can do some sensitivity analysis and show that that increase from low to high discharge is probably anywhere between about five to 13. 
So in general, we call it a tenfold increase in transport stress from low to high discharge. Now, what this means for sediment flux, as I've already pointed out, is that we go from something very minimally small, 86 tons per hour, to something exceptionally large during flood discharge conditions, which is over 10,000 tons per hour. So what we find here is this condition of punctuated sand transport in lowermost Mississippi River, where for during low discharge conditions, there's very limited to almost nil movement, whereas during high discharge conditions, there's a significant enhancement or augmentation in the sediment flux. The key points here is that sand transport increases by a factor of 100, two orders of magnitude, due to this tenfold change in boundary stress. Furthermore, this range in boundary shear stress conditions is not possible for reach average uniform flow conditions, what we call normal flow, which may be characterized by the depth slope product as shown here. So what we find is that there must be a condition of non-uniform flow in the lowermost Mississippi River that's giving rise to the significant variation in stress as well as sediment flux conditions. So we're going to explore that in the next few slides. What we find for the Mississippi River is that instead of having uniform flow conditions, we actually have what we call a backwater flow in the Mississippi River. To get a sense of what backwater flow is, I'd like to show this particular plot, which shows elevation above mean sea level indicated as zero here. Distance above head of passes of the outlet of the river shown moving from, up, um, from downstream to upstream, left to right across the x-axis here, and a series of profiles here. So this is high water discharge, air water interface. So the water surface during high water discharge and the water surface during low water discharge. The profiles that you see here are the channel bed profiles. This A to T is the Thalweg profile that you can see progressing downstream. And A to 60 is just the 60th percentile depth. So something that's just slightly deeper than the 50th or the median depth profile of the channel bed itself. What you can tell though from this particular plot is that the water surface elevation profile of the Mississippi River asymptotically approaches sea level at the river outlet. Furthermore, stage variability, the change in stage between low discharge to high discharge decreases as you move downstream. So what do I mean by that? If we go upstream, say river kilometer 600, what we find is a nearly doubling of water depth between low to flood water discharge. Whereas if we go downstream to within 50 kilometers of the outlet, we can see that the change in water surface elevation, the stage change is fractional compared to the overall water depth. It might be five or 10% increase. So you can see that there's this very strong change in how stage actually occurs where stage variation arises in the lower Mississippi River. We can invert those water surface profiles, elevation profiles to calculate water surface slope to further demonstrate how slope changes between low and high water discharge cases. So this plot here shows water surface slope on the y-axis with respect to distance upstream on the x-axis. What we find for low, moderate, and flood water discharge conditions is a strong variation in slope. I'll point out as well that if we plot bed slope here, what we find is at about river kilometer 600, the bed slope is equal to the water surface slopes across all water discharge conditions. This is a case of uniform flow condition where in fact the bed slope sets the water surface slope, which does not deviate even as a function of water discharge. Whereas if we progress downstream, what we see is a departure of bed slope and water surface slope, and moreover, a significant change in water surface slope progressively going downstream between low to moderate to flood water discharge. In fact, we can, this, this change in hydrodynamic conditions as shown here in the slope is what we characterize as backwater flow. That is flow velocity that decreases downstream in a spatial sense. We can calculate what that backwater flow condition looks like simply by looking at a backwater scale. What we can show here is how backwater conditions 
change for the Mississippi River by using a backwater length scale, LB. This characterizes the flow depth divided by the bed slope itself here. This gives us a characteristic backwater length scale that can actually be used to show where the non-uniform conditions exist in the Mississippi River. So just to bring some summary to what I've been showing you here, what we've been able to demonstrate is non-uniform or backwater flow affects boundary shear stress in the lower 650 kilometers of the Mississippi River. This results in a condition of punctuated sand transport where sand flux varies by two orders of magnitude from low to high water discharge conditions. We can relate this to the condition of a mixed bedrock alluvial channel. And what I'll propose to you here is that the stress in bend segments of the river is sufficiently high to, to locally suspend all the sediments during flood discharge condition so as to essentially carry all the coarse sand as a part of suspended transport, removing it from the bed and exposing the underlying substratum. This brings us to two critical questions here. The first is where is all the missing coarse sediment in the lowermost Mississippi River that would be necessary to fully alleviate the channel bed? And the second is, is how do these hydrodynamic and sediment transport feedbacks influence the development of fluvial deltaic stratigraphy? And that'll be the focus of the remaining remainder of my talk. Now, what I'd like to do here is show you the outcome of some models that we've used to address the first question, which is specifically, where does the coarse sediment actually exist in the lower Mississippi River? And what I've shown you here is a hydrodynamic computation that shows, or excuse me, a, a measurement that shows cross-sectional area with respect to distance above head of passes for low to floodwater discharge. And what we can do is use these data to produce a hydrodynamic computation for what water flow velocity should look like in the lower reaches of the Mississippi River between low, moderate, and floodwater discharge conditions as shown in this plot here. So what we see is this non-uniform flow condition that exists during low discharge where water velocity decreases as we progress downstream. And as we're already aware of, this lowers the sediment transport capacity and limits the amount of sediment flux that's measurable in the Mississippi River. Whereas during floodwater discharge, you can see that we have relatively consistent or uniform water flow velocity that allows for augmented sediment flux in the river system. We can use these hydrodynamic computations for velocity and input them into a bed material transport model and calculate how sediment transport should vary from low to floodwater discharge conditions from the head of passes, the river outlet upstream to where we have uniform flow conditions. And what we can see here is that during low water discharge, we significantly decrease our sediment flux progressing through this non-uniform or backwater flow region. Whereas during high water discharge, because we have significant stress, we can actually maintain sufficiently high velocity and therefore sediment transport throughout the lower reaches of the Mississippi River here. So what we can do is take those data that show sediment transport variations over time and space and use them to make predictions about how the bed elevation would change. This is specifically through what we call an extra model, which shows the time deviation of bed elevation where eta is elevation and dt here is just change in time as a consequence of spatial divergences and sediment flux, which are shown as dqs dx here. So if we take the computed sediment transport over time and space that I showed you in the previous slide and use that information to calculate bed elevation change, we produce the plot that we see here on the left, which shows predicted annual change in bed elevation with respect to distance upstream of the, of the outlet at head of passes. So if it were to be an equilibrium condition where we have nil deposition or erosion, it would be zero here. Whereas in areas where we actually have positive um, uh, calculations, we show deposition, and areas where we have negative calculations, we show erosion. And I'd like to point out that this portion where the model predicts erosion coincides with where we made observations that show limited sandy alluvial cover and the bedrock, the exposure of the underlying bedrock substratum for the Mississippi River. So in fact, this model is corroborated by our observations that indicate that there is a limit on sediment uh, cover on the on the bed. 
Furthermore, this model predicts between river kilometer 300 to 600 that we should have a big wedge of sediment deposit here. So we have aggradation where we have this normal flow to backwater transition. So I'd like to pose a question of what the morphological consequences are long-term for this point or this region of aggradation associated with this transition from normal flow to backwater flow or from uniform to non-uniform flow. To give you a sense of what that looks like from a planform perspective, here's a map of the state of Louisiana. The Mississippi Delta again is shown here. And river kilometer 300 or so upstream to 600 is shown in this yellow box here. So this is in fact is the region where we'd expect there to be aggradation associated with this non-uniform flow condition. And what we find is for that particular part of the river is a number of Holocene avulsions. So we've had five to seven significant Holocene avulsion points for the Mississippi River. It is where avulsion is where the river catastrophically changes course and moves to a new channel and a new build starts building a new lobe on the delta system overall. And what we find for that region of predicted channel bed aggradation is the nodal point for many avulsions that have occurred over the Holocene. And what we know, based on some very standard studies that have been produced in the last 20 years, is the first order control in avulsions is the super elevation of the channel bed with respect to the surrounding floodplain. And one would expect there to be super elevation of the channel bed in a region where we have aggradation, such as the non-uniform to uniform transition of the Mississippi River. Secondly, it turns out that the Mississippi River has highly variable lateral migration rates, as is shown in this particular plot here, which shows lateral migration with respect to distance above head of passes at the outlet. So what we find here, for example, is that from river kilometer, say 700 up to 1700, we have relatively consistent lateral migration. Whereas we have enhanced lateral migration right here, at river kilometer 500 to about seven or 800, and then essentially nil lateral migration in the lower couple hundred kilometers. And what our community knows about lateral mobility for river channels is this controlled by two factors. The first is development of channel bars, and the second is the strength, the integrity of the, of the bank line system itself. Both the development of channel bars and lowering of bank strength will lead to enhanced lateral migration. And we know that to be the case in rivers that are net deposition of sandy material, which both builds the bar and is incorporated into the floodplain so as to limit the bank strength of the floodplain material itself. So we expect there then to be enhanced lateral mobility in regions where we actually find channel bed aggradation such as the uniform to non-uniform or backwater transition of the lower Mississippi River. So what I'd like to do then is propose to you what's happening here is essentially that in this cartoon, as we can see in this cartoon, as we progress downstream to the outlet of the Gulf of Mexico, we have a low water surface profile that asymptotically approaches the elevation of the Gulf of Mexico. This reduces shear stress by lowering velocity which results in the deposition of coarse sediment to the channel bed that seemingly never makes its way downstream to the outlet of the river. So we see decreasing sediment transport capacity drives deposition of coarse bed material to the bed and essentially creates a migratory or transient prograding coarse grain sediment wedge within the channel of the Mississippi River. The question is, can we actually find this migrating coarse grain sediment wedge? And what I'll do to get us dialed into that is show you once again the actual channel bed profiles of the Mississippi River with respect to the water surface profiles. What we can do is regress the data as you see here to show that the channel bed slopes are relatively constant at nine times 10 to the minus five until we hit river kilometer approximately 270 right here. And then essentially in our bedrock reach, we lower the slope of the channel by a factor of nine. As you can see here, comparing the bedrock river slope to the upstream slope, there's about a factor of nine difference. In fact, in that region, we can also see decreasing grain size of the sediment material on the bed as we see there. That is, the coarse material is seemingly caught in the upstream uniform to non-uniform tra transition, 
and that the bed quickly finds as we progress downstream with sediment or sand that's capable of getting past this non-uniform flow condition, but nevertheless is fine enough that when it gets into bend segments with local enhanced shear velocity due to the bend itself can be propelled into suspension. In essence, this backwater filters coarse grain sediment and limits its mobility in the lower Mississippi River. Now for the final part of the talk, what I'd like to do is describe how we can apply this information about the time and magnitude variability of sand flux in the Mississippi River to inform about engineering designs that would divert water and sediment from the river to locate it to places in the delta that require this material in order to mitigate against wetland loss. Now, what I'll propose to you is that we need to constrain local conditions when using models to better understand how we can divert water and sediment to mitigate land loss. A classic example of this statement is shown by a very nice paper by Wan Suk Kim published in 2009, which tries to model two diversions on either side of the Mississippi River Delta lobe, as you see here, to build land itself into the adjacent wetlands in order to buffer against storm waves that would otherwise attack the society that lives within this part of the river delta itself here. So we need local conditions. We need constraints on the local conditions of timing and magnitude of sand movement in order to better constrain the engineering design of these particular diversions. So what I'm gonna show you is a study that we proposed for what we call the Bonnie Carey Spillway, which is located right where this yellow box is, just about 100 kilometers upstream of the city of New Orleans. Now, to give you a sense of background for what this spillway actually is, it's a part of the river where the levee can be removed to allow for flood water to evacuate across the landscape before entering Lake Pontchartrain. The idea behind the spillway structure is to prevent there to be high stages downstream at the city of New Orleans that would threaten the levees on the city of New Orleans. So the idea is to create a removable levee, a spillway structure that evacuates water from the river and flows into Lake Pontchartrain. What we had the opportunity to do was go study the spillway structure when it was opened during an enormous flood in the year of 2011. This happened to be the largest flood on record since the great flood of 1927. It was a three month long flood and it necessitated opening this emergency spillway structure here in order to evacuate water from the river. Now, just to give you a little bit of close up for what the spillway actually looks like, this is the Mississippi River, as you can see here, color coded with its depth as it flows past the spillway structure that you see here. The red here are guide levees that allow for water to flow out of the river across the landscape and enter into Lake Pontchartrain, which exists right here. We can look at cross-sectional profiles from A to A prime and B to B prime to get a better sense for how the spillway operates. That's shown in these blue and red lines here, respectively. What we find is the main portion of the channel exists here. At low water discharge conditions, the elevation or the stage itself here is contained within this entire portion of the channel but during flood flows, we actually elevate that stage and allow that stage to flood back across the forebay, which is shown in red and orange here, and essentially buttress up against the spillway. Now it's this spillway here that is the removable levee. We can get a sense for what that looks like in this particular photograph that I show in the lower left column here, which essentially shows me standing next to these spillway structures, these wood boards that can be removed by a crane that operates on top of a railroad track that exists above here. And what you can do is allow water to flow out of these particular areas. A photograph here is taken from an airplane by myself during an opening in 2011 and essentially shows how the forebay or the region adjacent to these removable levees is open, allowing water to spill into the spillway and flow across into Lake Pontchartrain itself here. I should point out, this can remove a significant volume of water, something like 6,000 cubic meters per second, which is a tremendous amount of water um, just overall, but you know, compared to the flood discharge of the Mississippi, might represent 10 to 20% of the total water coming downstream. Now, 
What we had the opportunity to do in our study of the 2011 opening was to wait for the flood wave to uh, rescind, for the water to dry out in the spillway and go out and collect aerial images of the spillway itself. So to give you a point of reference here, this is the Mississippi River. It flows from right to left across your screen here. This is the spillway structure right here. So that's the removable levee. And what you find here are significant sand deposits associated with the removal of sediment laden water from the river into, into the spillway structure as you see here. In fact, these sand deposits are worked up into trains of dunes as you can see here. And in fact, they're quite large in size. For example, here's a field assistant standing in the crest of one of, or I'm sorry, in the trough of one of these dunes with its crest back up around him. And to give you a sense of size, he's about two meters in height. So you can see that these dunes that are being built by the sand leaving the river into the spillway are quite large. Now, interestingly enough, if we look at the, the, the um, sample size, the grain size of the sand that's making its way out of, the spill, uh, out of the river and depositing in the spillway, what we find is that it's essentially equivalent to the river uh, sand that we find in the channel bed adjacent to the spillway. In essence, what we have is a perfect matching between the sand that's in the river channel and the sand that's depositing in the spillway. And one could expect this, right? That the source of sand is the same and therefore their grain sizes match. And in fact, that's what we find. What we did is go through and actually calculate the spatial distribution of all the sand within the spillway and its measured thickness to calculate what the total volume of sand is that was this posit in the spillway, namely multiplying its total area times its depth in order to get the, the measured volume of sand. And we come up with a number during the 2011 event of about 4.9 million cubic meters of sand. What we're gonna do is compare that, that, that um, uh, measurement of sand to a calculation of how much sand we should expect to deposit in the spillway, just based on the concentration and volume of water and sand evacuating the spillway. So it's a very simple model where we predict the volume of sand by multiplying the sand concentration times total water volume times the time period of spillway opening and multiplying by a factor that corrects for its concentration. And due to lack of time, I won't go into the details of this model, but what we find is that essentially the predicted volume of sand is about 5.1 million cubic meters, which essentially matches what we produced before, uh, that is for our measurement. So what I wanna show you here is that we can actually get a very good handle on how these spillways are actually predicted to evacuate sand based on measurement versus observation and modeling framework to calculate the amount of sand that one should expect to leave the spillway structure. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just conclude here um, and then take your questions. And what I'll argue is that to accurately predict sand discharge from engineered diversions of any river, we need to have control on the local suspended sediment concentration. There's a significant amount of coarse sediment that can be routed through engineering diversions and used for land building. And I'll further emphasize that sand load is imperative to di divert because it's this sediment that provides a stable substrate upon which vegetation colonizes, which then limits water velocity and leads to further deposition of sediment, including fine muds. Okay, so I'll end my talk there. And, um, and I'd be happy to open the, the discussion for any questions that we have in, in the next few minutes. But thank you for your attention. Great, thank you a lot, Jeff. It's, as always, your lecture is something very fundamental and outstanding. Uh, so very valuable and uh, reasonable for, for young scientists to see this sort of uh, talk. So thanks a lot. Uh, so we have uh, not big time uh, left, but so I will start with the questions. And the question first comes from a uh, student of hydrology department, uh, Ekaterina Krastin. So the question is, how does river engineering and channel modification affect the sediment transport in Lowermost, Mississippi? Yeah, so this is a, a very interesting question. Um, I am now a part of a study that is actually working 
at a part of the river upstream from where I was talking about today, at what we call the Old River Diversion Complex, which actually takes water and sediment from the main Mississippi River Channel and pushes it into the Atchafalaya River Basin, which is just to the west. And it turns out that the diversion of water and sediment from there actually lends to channel bed aggregation of sediment. So in this particular circumstance, what we find is that diverting water without diverting an appropriate amount of sediment will lend to sediment deposition in the channel bed itself. So it's a very good point that's made here is that anytime we engineer with the river, including diversions, we must take into account the fact that we're lowering the transport capacity by removing water and must remove an equivalent amount of coarse material. Otherwise, we'll lend to deposition, which can otherwise alter the, the, the dynamics of the river system. Okay, so uh, then uh, the, the, the another question is from the Plymouth University, uh, from the uh, recent geography graduate, Lewis Hill. So the question is, the idea of backwater being a filter of coarse sediments is very interesting. Does this directly influence rate of fine sediment transport? Oh, that's a very good question. I've never actually thought about that question. Um, I don't know. My, my intuition says perhaps no, but it would be a very interesting modeling exercise to see about how we would expect the rate of fine grain sediment to change as a function of removing the coarse sediment from the sediment load. So that, that's a very good idea. I, I've never heard of anyone pursuing this problem before, um, but I think through some simple model calculations, we might be able to get at an answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, so maybe just briefly, Jeff, what is this great flood of 1927? So, I mean, maybe make this question for general uh, knowledge. Uh, compared to 2011, what's how they differed? What was about magnitude? What was larger? Right, so the, 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 so it's an interesting question. The 1927 flood was actually larger in terms of water volume. However, the stages throughout the Mississippi River were larger during 2011. And this has to do okay. with the fact that there was this, there, well, you know, in the intervening 80 or 90 years, there was deposition of bed material sediment on the channel bed, which in essence was occupying part of the okay. bed, enhanced or elevated the stages uh, for the river discharge. So higher stages for 2011, but slightly lower water than 1927. Okay, okay, nice, interesting. It's uh, sometimes we have uh, in Russia, the uh, magnitudes of the floods, which were in the beginning of the century, now is not even possible in this South region to imagine because the, the, the winters are disappeared and that's uh, what we have in 1917, for example, like the large flood in this area 